Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I, I'll go home and tell Ruth there were 75 out this morning. In other words, they're not in church. They're out of church. And uh, that uh, we need to remember uh, uh, those that are lost and do our power to bring them back into God, the line of God. I hope that many of you have read this our, uh, little note that I put in bulletin or attached to the bulletin. I, I feel that it's my responsibility to be as open, open with you all as possible uh, with what's going on with me. Uh, first of all, I, I, I need your prayers, I, uh, mainly because of the fact that we don't know what's going to happen. But at times, I know this is a standard procedure, but yet uh, anything can happen. But I, I want to share with you the idea that I've had problems with my heart rhythm for a long time. Uh, in fact, the first, first diagnosed in 2004 when I was having a hip replacement. And uh, since my hospitalization a year ago, last July, in August, they haven't been able to get it back into even though I've been taking medication, I've been doing everything I could, they put me a blood thinner and everything else to try to do it. So we're going to try this and see what happens. Uh, I appreciate Ruth's employment because they have gone out of their way in order to accommodate her so that uh, she will be pretty well isolated at work and not bring anything into me as I have to take this coronavirus test. Mike scares me. Blowing up the nose for 13 minutes. <laughs> um, I don't know whether I can stand that or not. <laughs> but we'll have to see. I don't know what, what, why, but this past week I've been going through the various churches I have served. Beginning and thinking about different things that happened in some of my ministries and experiences. I, I, I can remember when I was preaching in Townsville, Pennsylvania, and this. Uh, had a, a well-known place because that is where the first well was driven for the purpose of finding oil. Now they had oil before, but it was by accident that they found the well. But this was where the intention was to find oil, and they, they found it. And they have a beautiful museum there. Uh, if you ever want to go up and just visit the museum, it uh, is very pretty. And as I was preaching there, I was there for about eight years. Uh, Ruth was born up there. And she was a year old when we moved. But while I was there, there was this teenage girl that was grown up from a little brat. She was a beautiful young lady uh, at this particular time. She was still in high school, about ready to graduate. And one morning, uh, as I was shaking people out, and I, that's the term that preachers use, you shake them out. But uh, she stopped and said, Brother Phil, I have a question for you. Her name was Sherry, and I said, Sherry, what's the question? She says, if a man comes forward, making a confession of faith, is baptized, and as he's coming out of the baptistry, he drops over dead with a heart attack. Will he still go to heaven? And I told her at the time, I said, I really don't know how God judges people, but I, I assume from everything I have read, he will. I mean, that'd be the same as a deathbed confession as far as I was concerned. Then she made a statement. She says, that seems so unfair. I've been a Christian as a young teenager for a long time, and I have to really, really work in the church, and I have to watch myself, and I have to live, live through temptation, trials, and tribulations, and still be a Christian. And he doesn't have to do any of these things. He gets the same reward as I do. And uh, with that, she walked away. I uh, thought about the comments she made. And there were 
followed by several messages in my sermons, and I told called Jerry and Oprah I was going to do this. I might add, before I even go any further, a little side note here. The last I heard, Sherry is very actively involved in all of the churches in the Tudorsville area. She has become more of a singer. She goes and sings a funeral. She sings praise of God's praises in many of the congregations that are up here. And she's become known, well known for her beautiful voice and her opportunity that she will give churches to have her come to sing. So I, I feel that I did accomplish something while I was there. If I did not affect any more than just one person. And I, I, I got thinking about this. First of all, I want to say that salvation is not based upon the works that we do. Uh, I think that's quite clear by Scripture that we're not saved by the works of righteousness. And by the way, a work of obedience is not the same as a work of righteousness. A work of obedience is submission to the will of God. A work of righteousness is where we allow our faith to have its proper works and we get involved with doing the work of the church. And we need to realize that what we do for the church is very limited as far as our salvation is concerned, even though our faith is seen by the works that we do. So having said that, we go on to looking at Sherry's question. And the more I thought of it, the more I came to the conclusion that she was right. Now that might sound strange coming from me, but she was right. It is a very unfair situation for this gentleman who fell dead with a heart attack. It's not the young lady or the uh, individual that has to live a Christian life for a long time, but for the person that doesn't get the opportunity to experience the joys and the blessings of being a Christian. I, I, I like the book of Hebrews where it talks, in Hebrews, the, uh, I'm looking for the verse of scripture, uh, the sixth chapter, the ninth verse, where it talks about our salvation and the things that accompany salvation. When I was a teenager, I, I worked in the steel mills at, at, while I was in college. And one of the things that we learned there was the products of the steel industry. Uh, the, the coal that they made to be able to heat the furnaces with, now they use gas or electricity. But they made coke out of it, and they made a much cleaner air from the burning of the coal. So they really buy products of many things. But the blessings that we have as Christians are byproducts of our Christianity, of our faith, of our salvation. Certainly we all become a Christian in order to be able to obtain eternal life. But in the meantime, from the time we become a Christian until we gain eternal life through our death, physical death, there are many blessings that are ours. And I revel in those blessings. Uh, we're living in troublesome times. Uh, times in which uh, we see things happening that should not be happening. We see many crimes being committed in the name of justice. And I don't think those crimes justify, are justified by the point that they come out. And don't get me wrong, because I am against civil injustice. I, I'm against the uh, police brutality but I'm also against the brutality against their police, too. I don't know how many of you realize that in the uh, uh, 2019, there were 21 policemen that were killed by black people. So far this year, there have been 27 people killed by black people, our police department. It's not safe to be a policeman. 
But you don't hear about that. You don't hear about that. And why the police have to take extraordinary measures to be able to protect themselves. I'm against any civil injustice, inequity. I remember when I was teaching college, business college, I had a black boy come in that was very involved in the race riots that were taking place elsewhere as well as in Huntington. He was responsible for the burning of a lot of the school, Marshall School equipment in the 4th Avenue one time and would praise our media and they kept it quiet. But he came in because the judge told him, you either get back to school or go to jail. And as he was uh, went back to Marshall, Marshall says, you said, we don't want you, you get out of here. So he came to the Huntington College of Business where I was teaching. It was unusual that every paper that he turned into me uh, as his teacher that I needed to grade was the outline with the black felt marker in the more or less a black frame with a black felt marker. And across it would be a top and some uh, empty space would be black is beautiful. I mean, he was that strong. One day I walked to school, he was the only one in the hall. It was snowing outside, the snow was falling, and I looked at him and said, hey Charles, how are you? And he said, I'm fine. And I said, isn't it pretty outside? He says, it sure is. He said, I said, you know why that is, don't you? He looked at me kind of funny. I said, he said, no, why? I said, because white has its beauty too, and I kept on walking. I was helping him after school one day to be able to get over some problems he was having with the county. And he looked at me and said, Mr. Foss, it doesn't matter to you any difference in, uh, uh, that I, I'm black, does it? I said, oh, are you black? I said, I know that you are one of the pretty arrangements that God has made as far as the human race is concerned, but that's the only race I see is the human race. I said, black adds to it. I said, the white adds to it. The yellow add to it, the red add to it, and so forth. I said, they're all just a great big beautiful bouquet as far as God's concerned. He came in and told me one of the most racial jokes I think I ever heard. And I looked at him, my mouth dropped, I said, I don't think you told that joke. He said, I, I was wondering what you would do. And from that point on, we were the closest friends. He would come in at lunchtime and sit at my desk and we would talk. And we handled many of his problems. And when he left school and went to Boston, and he wrote back to me and said, uh, the school and thank God that I was able to help him see the truth of life, is the way he put it. I think we need to realize that there are many fine byproducts, and one of those byproducts is the fact that we love one another, regardless. And we're going to be talking about those byproducts. Paul wrote in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, that if we in this life have hope only, we are of all men most miserable. But what are some of the byproducts? And by the way, I, I got confused with the calendar again. Uh, next week, it happens to be the 4th of July weekend as far as I'm concerned. You're going to sermon on our nation next week, I guess. The, the very first one I think about is answered prayer. Now, I have a strange idea about prayer. In Matthew 7, 7, Jesus said, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. He that seeketh findeth. And he that knocketh it shall be opened to. I have a personal opinion. And you can take exception with this because I know it's an opinion. That every prayer that we offer is always answered in the affirmative. 
I do not believe that prayer is ever answered in the negative. Now, does that shock you? I think our prayer ought to be not our will, but thine be done. And if that is on our heart as we pray, and even though we list things that we would like to have, if we live pray in the attitude that let God's will be done, then His will is going to be done. And that's going to be affirmative. That's going to be affirmative. I think God says no, the same way I told my kids no many times when they were growing up. Steve was one of the ones that uh, I told no many times to. And so well was with Mary Alice. Answer prayer. I'm sure that there are many of you that can tell me times when God answered your prayers. When my wife passed away, I was devastated. I kid you not. But it was an answer to prayer that her suffering was over. Her suffering was over. I think Christian fellowship is a blessing. I have a lot rather be with a Christian person than I would with an unchristian person. And I've had the experience of being with both in some of the jobs I've had done through my life. I, I, I long to be with Christian people. Nancy, I was stopped by this morning. I was going to ask you permission to say something. I'm going to say it anyway. That during the time that we were in lockdown, Nancy called me and said, Phil, when are we going to start church services? I miss getting together with the people. I see Marilyn shaking her head now, and I, I miss you all so much during that particular time. I'm going to miss you on the 12th. I'm going to miss you on the 12th when I can't be here. And I love Christian people. Even those that were mean, even those that are sometimes contemptible, they're well-meaning and everything else, but Christian fellowship. I, I love that which is said, that which we have declared unto you, John says in First John, the first chapter, that we should have fellowship with God. And our fellowship with God is through our brothers in Christ, sisters in Christ. What about forgiveness of sin? Oh, I wish I were perfect. Don't you? I know you wish I were perfect too. <laughs> but I wish I were perfect. I wish I did not have uh, one of the temptations. I said last week, I, we all face uh, heavy weights in life and, uh, and the sin which besets us. Thanks be to God, even though we are Christian, God forgives. John, writing to Christian people in 1 John, the first chapter, the ninth verse, makes a statement that if we confess our sins, what, uh, then God is faithful to, for, to uh, forgive us from all unrighteousness. I had a friend one time who told me that he didn't go to church anymore because he was told by a preacher that if he sinned up to become a Christian, God doesn't forgive that sin. I had a long talk with him. And he started to come back to church. Praise the Lord. He's now going to do his reward. Forgiveness is sin. God forgives. And when he forgives, he will remember those sins no more. And he's the only one that can do that. We have a peace that passes all understanding. A peace because we have made our peace with God. He knows He's with us. He will not forsake us. And that all things work together for good because we love God and we have been called according to His purpose. There's a peace that passes all understanding. There's power to overcome temptation. God, with the temptation, will furnish a way of escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. 
And by all times our temptation is so hard that it's almost impossible to overcome. You put a candy bar in front of me, and I'm going to eat that candy bar regardless of what the temptation is. And by the way, one of the notes that I got from the doctor's office the other day told me to cut back on my caffeine. Oh, nobody's going to take that coffee away from me. <laughs> oh, well. There's joy in winning a soul to Christ. I served a congregation one time down in Raceland. We went over 13 weeks with a response to every invitation. I, I, I remember one of the women of the church talking about that time. We, we grew from a number of about 15 to 20 up to over 100 in less than three times. I thank God, God for Steve because he and another boy always took the, up the account of the offer. And they would stand in the back and flash the sign by their hands how many we people we had in the congregation. And I looked back during the announcement time when I was giving the announcements. Steve and this other fellow were not there. I looked around, they were just not there, so I did not ask how many we had off this morning. I know, my God, I'm talking about Steve, not you. <laughs> but I, I, then I look back and Steve, and this other fellow came in with another boy. And they went, <laughs> it was 99, and they went out and found the other boy and brought him into church, just saying we had 100 that morning. I'll guarantee you, you go outside, and on your way home, no matter how far you have to drive, you're going to see somebody that was not in church. And God loves them as much as he loves you. God wants to see them in kind churches working for his kingdom as much as he wants you to do it. And as far as I'm concerned, there's no greater joy and to be involved with the winning of souls for Christ. This woman that I was talking about, Donna Rachel, on that particular Sunday when we had the uh, 13th Sunday, where suddenly we had a, a, a response to every invitation, she says, oh, I can see the angels dancing in the aisle. And believe me, you feel the Spirit. You feel the Spirit. Oh, there's so many blessings that we have in Christ. So many joys, so many things that accompany our salvation, that so many people miss by their not being in church. And I'll guarantee you they cannot get the same joy. They cannot get the same opportunity by worshiping at home, watching television, this type of thing. It is a fellowship you have one with another as you come together. Knowing that where Jesus, Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, he will be here also. There's no greater joy than being with Christ, who are those who believe that he is God, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. We're going to be singing our invitation. There's one here that needs to make a confession, to make any decision in Christ. We invite you to come. As we stand.